we'll we'll fill it in. Uh, and I think by answering the questions, we'll probably uh, do a lot better than me just sitting up here running my mouth. I like your t-shirts. What can you tell me about? Well, uh, our t-shirts, they basically represent like the road to becoming like a better Christian. And it's like, you can see on the sides, we got different logos like basketball, like athletics and all this other stuff that's really not more focused on God and whatnot. Ty, stand up. Oh, all right. Make sure you get the back. I'm going to videotape this. <laughs> can, can you tell us something? Romans 323, for all of sin. Um, we got Romans 3.23, for all have sinned, you got to know the rest, that fallen short in the glory of God. And ouch is something that our scenes that we do, Derek Malone, he always says straight facts. So if we got one that's really you know, close to our hearts, we usually say ouch. Now, how do, you, how do you find the young men? Is it just young men or is it young men and women? It's young men and young women. But how did you guys determine to become part of this group were you recruited did you school church 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 is this church that's that's part of it but now we have kids that are part of this this has grown i've been in this capacity almost two years and now there are kids that don't even attend our church that come to do this work but they're not part of our church which is amazing because they have churches that they belong to and or don't belong to, but but they want to work in the community, uh, and and that's that's because they see other young people modeling what it means to be civic, and um, that's that's really catching on. I had a, I had two 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 young people came yesterday that were not part uh, in our previous uh, um, going outs and do, you know working in ministry because there's a lot of teaching that goes forth too. I know people just see them out, but. Before they even went out into the streets, we got about a year and a half of classes learning about the Bible and learning about ministry and what, what Jesus actually was doing. Um, and it's not just to, to leave the, the bread on the table, so to speak, but it's to take the bread of life to people that will sustain them even after that we're gone. Uh, when we go into a place, we don't just give things out without praying with that community. And, and we kind of mandated, mandated to them as well, like, hey, you got to come pray with us. You, you got the stuff in your hand, you know, in, in Matthew's chapter six, there's Jesus talking to him or John chapter six, you see Jesus talking to him, and, and everybody's following him. He says, you only follow me because I can feed you. So we, we make sure that there's some accountability there too, is to know like, hey, we're coming, but as as we come back, you start preparing your kids to, to receive what's coming and then put them in a position to get some information because information leads to transformation. That's what I teach them. Without information, you cannot transform. And so you have to be open to that. There have to, there has to be some engagement between us and the community when we come into the community. It's it's their community. It's it's their campus. And so when we leave, you you know they have to have dialogue about what needs to be changed as we're trying to help them change. And we're, we're to promote that and, and create a segue for them to change, but and be the model for change. But ultimately, it's going to be up to them to continue to change after that we're gone. And so that's why we stay on that one campus so long. Uh, because you cannot change a person. I was I was once told by Dr. Um, uh, uh, Truman Martin that if you touch a man one time in his back, he'll mistake it for a bump. But if you touch him more than one time, he'll turn around. So that's kind of the philosophy is that, and if you think about Jesus' ministry, Jesus' ministry was three years, but he stayed in the, in, in the region of Galilee. He didn't go all the way around. The apostles, they did that. Paul, he did that. But, but Jesus' ministry was in that little small region and he stayed there and he focused on those people until they really got and understood what it was. And so with them, it's the same thing is that we we try to put them in the position where they're the one doing the work. Like when I came in yesterday, I had tons of stuff, right? And I just put it on the table and I says, okay, this is what I'm thinking, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to do the algorithm mentally. You guys are going to do that. And so here it is. And I, and I just, I'm back out the way because they have to be able to do this themselves. Uh, that makes them more functional. That 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 drives that leadership. That sex, that self actualization skill set comes into play. You know what I mean with the Holy Spirit. So if a kid has gift in them, it's my thinking is they have gift in them. You cannot actualize that gift without the kid having something to tend and keep to. That's Genesis two fifteen. The, when when he set Adam in the garden, he told him tend and keep, tend and keep the garden. So people have to have things to do with their hands 
to promote productivity in a community. You find that communities that are 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 distraught or 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 socially and economically deprived are probably communities where people don't have things to do with their hand and their mind in conjunction with their spirit. I can show you poverty there, always. And so that that is what we try to do is we try to bring hope into these places, uh, so that these kids can see other models of someone doing something other than. Uh, selling drugs, beating up their mamas, stealing stuff, because they don't have models. Like when we were in the bath the other day, this little kid, when I was telling you guys about with the tattoo, I, I sat there and I'm like, man, I wonder, this kid will probably never, because that was me, right? I've been on my own since I was 11 years old. My parents abandoned me when I was 11. My mom was being beat by my dad. My dad run the streets. My dad's 74 years old right now. Uh, horrible health, horrible health. Tries to indict me on, you know, you're not doing anything for me. Hey, hey look, dude, like what did you do? Like you set this up, you know, you set you set yourself up, you you neglected me, but but I still take care of them still, you know, because we're we're we're, to, we're told in the Bible to honor our parents. It didn't tell you if you liked them or not. It says to honor them, and then the days on the earth shall be long. So I see a lot of people go, well, my mom didn't do or my dad didn't do. I don't teach that to them. I don't care what your parents did. The Bible says to honor your parents. <laughs> That's what it says. It doesn't say if you like them or like what they're doing. And so you have to teach kids the real model. You have to show them the real model. And so I, I take care of this guy. It's, it's been very tough to put be put in this position, but this position was um, I was catapulted into this position mentally, I believe, and spiritually by a man who's uh, he's now a retired minister. Is the old white guy with eight fingers? His name was Brother Humphrey, Edgewood Baptist Church. He was placed into that that community when I was a kid, and I remember I remember everything he did for us. I was ten years old, eleven years old, and this guy was. We ate every day. He fed us every day. These guys. <laughs> I feed them all the time. Uh, they, they, they're spoiled, is what they are. Um, this guy, but he didn't spoil us. He put clothing on the table. He laid out all these tables, and he put clothing on the table, and you paid a quarter. And you put the clothes in the bag, you weren't allowed to pick. And whatever you didn't use, you had to bring it back. So so all those kind of the things that, that were going on as a kid with me kind of stuck to my head, and I, and I pushed that stuff over to them because... I found that there's there's uh, uh, the immortality of influence is, is is awesome, right? Because because it's not what you do with a kid today that that has real change and promotes real change. It's what you do today that's going to change tomorrow. Because tomorrow is very important, right? Self preservation and community preservation is what we're actually aiming at. Because you cannot change adults today; they're stuck in their ways. And so we concentrate when we go on these campuses. We concentrate on the children, and we do look like, and we do a drive down. All right, what we do is uh, we get in vans and cars, right? And so we'll tailgate through a community, and what we're looking for is we're looking for activity where people are smoking, smoking dope, drinking beer, and children are around. That's what we're looking for, and, and when we ride down on you, they're out, they're out the vans, and they got on backpacks. And I'll show you pictures in a minute, but they got on backpacks. And we're coming straight at you. God love you, so do I. Ain't nothing you can do about it. And, and they got the No, you don't got to put your beard down, man. It's cool. Right? Because I want that conviction right there. Like, you see, you know what you're doing. Like, you know what you're doing in front of these kids. You know it's not right. you just not been confronted with it. Now you're confronted with it, and we ain't saying anything. It's just a lot of red shirts. So when we come into your community, now it's now people kind of know when we come in. They see the vans coming. The kids are coming running to the vans, and the grown-ups kind of move to the side, which is a respect factor if you don't understand what's going on in the hood, because they don't have to move to the side to let you do the work. They don't they don't bother us. We don't we don't get antagonized. They don't say anything to us. They just let us do the work. Uh initially, right, they would say, no, I'm cool, I don't want anything. And we don't we don't buy that. Yeah you do. That's your pride. You do want help. Everybody wants help. And so what we do is we have we have three pillars that we operate on in closing is that we operate on these three things. We validate a person when we go into the community, we respect them, and then we love them. You cannot love somebody that you don't validate and respect. And what does that mean? When we say validate somebody, what we say, it's not it's not who you are, it's what you are. Who you are is poor, who you are is white, who you are is black, who you are is rich. That's who you are. What you are is a child of God. And that's what we focus on. And since we all child, children of God, we, we focus on the most high of God's uh, uh, value in the person. Though the Bible says he has no respect to person, but that's not what he tells us to do. He says that you ought to treat your neighbor as you treat yourself. And so that that's that's cool, right? So in Luke chapter 4, that we are to proclaim the gospel and set the captives free. That's that's what we do, right? We have to proclaim the gospel and set the, co the, the captives free. And so that's a lot of work, right? And so that's what I try to get them to understand. It is never easy. It is never easy. Even in, in just yesterday, with the amount of money 
that I spent out of my pocket, it was frustrating because I asked a certain group of people who I was expecting to get funds from, hey, I need this. And they they were like, they said no, but then this morning they called and said, well, we didn't, we didn't understand you. Oh no, you understood me. It's just that, it's just that I did it anyway. I, you know, my thing, I have a, a saying, and, and you guys, if you, if you come to work with me, you'll, you'll know me, you'll, you'll learn to love me, I'm sure. But um, <laughs> it's, uh, I'd rather ask for forgiveness than permission. Because a lot of times when people are, are pessimistic about these kind of works, they're like, that's not going to work. You know, and they're sitting there, let's, let's meet about it. You know, let's go have a meeting about it. And there's nine people sitting there with nine, nine opinions or nine vision. And I'll say this is that when, when God gives one a vision and you got a, a vision and then he has a vision and he has a vision, typically two people, that's thy vision. Yeah. So, so that's not going anywhere. You'll be meeting forever. And so, so, you know, Abraham didn't sit and ask Sarah anything. He just kind of did what he was supposed to do. And God's calling you in, in your spirit to go and do something instead of sitting around in a meeting. You know, we just finished, uh, what was that, uh, the block party? They asked me, says, well, bring, bring, we need some kids. And they went to the last minute. And I says, well, why are you just not coming to us? Here's what I say to adults. Why do you want to prostitute or slave their labor instead of join them? It's always it's always one of those, we need kids, bring kids. No, no, no. Adults need to be where kids are so that they can work with the young people. And it's, it's not hard for you to say, hey, come here, I need you to do this. Because they already trust you. They already know you. They already know, they know what you're about. But when you're asking them to do something and they don't know you and trust you and you ain't you don't have no sweat equity with them, it ain't just your money. You don't have any sweat equity and, and you have your hands rolled up in the in the fire with them, they probably don't respect you. So when you look at our community, I would say that our community is disenfranchised from and, and, and let's be honest, from wars, we look at wars, the average age in Vietnam war was sixteen years of age. It's the young people that fight. Old people don't fight wars. Old people don't go out into the community and pass out stuff and, and wrestle with the thugs. And that's not going to be us, right? You're in the back and, and you're facilitating resources. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And they're supposed to be out front making it happen. And why is that important? It's because if they get a grasp as to what that looks like and what that feels like, your community changes over a period of time because they're the one working in the community. And then they're not going to let somebody come in their community when they're building it up to tear it up. So when you think about the book of Nehemiah in closing, is that in, in the book of Nehemiah, at first in chapter four, you see when he came back to build the walls of Jerusalem, uh, they were laughing like, ah, oh, there's no way he's gonna, he ain't gonna do nothing. What, what can Nehemiah do? But, but Nehemiah, didn't, he didn't feel that way. He felt that the, the Most High God had empowered him to do the work. And then once the wall was halfway built, then, then those like Tobiah, and Sanibal was like, oh my God, this guy's actually getting some work done. And they was like, we got to chop him down. We got to stop this guy. And, and they, their reasoning for stopping him was, was interesting. When I was reading the story, what was interesting is they saw him as a, a, as a threat because they thought, in fact, that he was setting up this wall to fortify his, his attempt to become king and then fight against them. And that was never the intention. His intention was to fortify the breaches in the wall so that all the foolishness couldn't get in and out without being noticed. And I'm going to say in our community that, that it's been breached. There are no walls. Civitan and other community uh, coalitions need to, to get together and fortify the city. And until that happens, there's always going to be breach. You're going to have fit and all. You're going to have prostitution. You're going to have girls being transported. Because it's, there, you don't have to breach it. It's wide open. There's, the walls are in, in shambles. The, it's, it's, there's nothing there. And so what we're doing is, is we're, we're just putting it together as we see fit, you know, where we're at. That's one of the things that Nehemiah did when you look at that, is Nehemiah gave the people the responsibility where they would be closest to the portion of the wall that they were building because you can't have do it there because the breach will take place in your position. Yeah. And so we were just looking for people that want to partner with us to help fortify the city. That's all that's all we're doing. We're not looking for no handouts or anything like that because if that was the case, we would have been waiting on people. We've been doing this all summer long. Kids giving up their summer to do this. Even when it's ninety five degrees, 
You know, I, I, I wondered if, well, I wonder if they're gonna come this summer. Cause you know, we're, I'm 51. You know, you, you wonder if they're gonna come. And then you look, there they go. Then you go, right, next week. This has been going on two years. And this started off a 30 week Bible study called Belief Series. And how many kids do we have then? 10? Yeah, about 10, 11 kids. How many you got now? Uh, and any given day, it could be 40, 50. It, don't, it just depends on how many show up. And we just sent 12, 12, 12 college for Ohio State. You know how I was getting to Ohio State? Four mm -hmm. from our group, Ohio State bound. Right? Morehouse. You know Morehouse? Mm -hmm. Right? Spelman. We got, we got kids going some great places. Sinclair, great place. I started there, right? And I always tell them, it's, it's, it's not about your journey, it's about your destination. That's the, I say that to them all the time. It's not about your journey. It's your you don't know who God's going to run you across. I'm, I'm working on Tony's porch. I'm not thinking about ministry to that degree, but Tony is, Tony's like, man, listen, man. And he's like, I got goosebumps, man. The spirit's moving, brother. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right? He's like, I, I got to have you come down and eat with us. I know you met him. You met him. He's working on your porch? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. That's how I met him. I own a roofing business. Oh, and okay. one third of my money goes to community. Literally. I don't know what other people do with their money, uh, but but I give mine to kids. And they'll tell you it's true. A lot. And I don't gripe about it. So, And I don't have a lot of money. I just think that we're supposed to do that. That's what you're supposed to do. You're not going to leave with anything. Uh, but I'd rather, give it to some, I'd rather give it to them if it's going to cause a work in their life to change the community. Because I'm not going to be here much longer, and, and neither are you. Right? You're but a vapor, the Bible says. And, and then they'll be putting you in a box, rolling you somewhere, and dumping you in the ground. And that'll be the end of it. And the, the question you have to ask yourself is, what did you leave behind? What did you build? Not, not a bank account, not a house, not a car. Like, what did you build? Like, what you guys are doing, that's real work. You know, that's, that's real work. I commend you. And that's why I was, uh, we're going to do, we're going to help you guys. Or when you need young people to be places to do things, you can, you can call on us. We have, we have the labor. We, and, and my kids are responsible, and they've been trained to work in vineyards like that. They, I don't have to train them. They've been with me two years. They know what the expectation is. And they know how to conduct themselves. And so you guys have our support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Where is your church at?